I'm a certified alcohol and drug counselor of a nationwide certification as well as the uh, California certification, branching off into recovery coaching. I'm an advocate for kids, and I'm a parent, and now I'm a grandparent. I'm a Christ follower, and I also now work at the church. So I was working in the field, in the trenches with Christina. So I've worked in detox. I've worked in residential. I've worked in outpatient. I've worked in intensive outpatient. I've been in the field of alcohol and drugs for a long time. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Oh, okay, so I'm going to go through every slide really fast. And at the end of each drug, I will ask you if you have any questions about it. Um, because your question might be answered before we get to the end of the slide. If you have any questions as we go, write them down. And during the end, during the discussion part, which I will try to talk fast enough to get to, um, we can answer some more questions and hopefully have a discussion. And I know some of you have to get back. I'm willing to stay a little bit later and talk, but not everybody can because they have to pick up their kids. So, okay, so let's get started. <gasps> it worked. Wow. Okay, so here's the plan tonight. We're going to learn about all the different drugs, and then we're going to learn how they affect your brain and your body. We're going to learn, uh, th towards the end, we're going to learn how to stay safe and how to keep kids safe, and then we'll have questions and answers. And keep in mind this presentation, we're talking about how to keep your kids safe. Consenting adults over the age of 21, you know, the same rules don't apply, right? But you still need to know about drugs and alcohol. But when I say certain things about marijuana, alcohol, et cetera, I'm not talking about kids doing them. I'm talking about grownups because kids really shouldn't be doing them for the reasons that I will tell you. Okay. So the first thing you have to know is what is a drug? Here's a couple of definitions. My favorite one is the purple one. It's a substance that has a physiological effect when ingested. That's what physiological means. Had to look it up. Um, that being said, is sugar a drug? Just something to think about. We won't have a discussion about it, but it does affect people, right? Um, and then drugs come from different sources, three different sources. The first one is plants, like marijuana, mushrooms, tobacco, processed plants. So they take the plant, they process it. That's like cocaine, heroin, and then synthetic drugs, um, which are totally man-made, like ecstasy, amphetamines are some examples of that. Okay. And then how do different people do drugs? There's five routes of administration, transdermal, which is through the skin, um, like nicotine patches, uh, swallowing, snorting, intravenous, and inhalation. And then there's another one you don't get to answer. Does anybody know what another um, method is for ingesting drugs? Any guesses? Yes, Chris. Yes, actually, that was the plus another one less common still, eye drops, yes. And then there's also something called booty bumping. I don't have to explain what that is. I think it's kind of self-explanatory. Okay, um, which is a thing. All right, next slide. Why are some reasons why people might use drugs? Anybody? Escape, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of different reasons. Escaping, curiosity, experimentation, um, addiction eventually for some people. But there's a lot of different reasons why people use drugs. Some people just want to try stuff. Um, the reason I'm doing this presentation is because of this fact right here. Um, overdose rates went up 30% during COVID, which means that it went up to 107,600 people. Which means it was around like 70,000 and it went up a lot. And then uh, they said this like it was something great. 40 fewer deaths in 2022, but that's 40 fewer than 100,000 is not really significant. There's still 20,000 more people in 2019. So that's an actual fact. So if anybody says, oh, COVID, eh, nothing bad came out of it. Besides, no, this came out of it. More overdoses, a lot more overdoses, a lot, a lot, a lot. And um, a lot of them are kids and young adults, and that really troubles me. So that's why I'm doing this presentation. Uh, we talked earlier about kids. This is why kids should not do drugs. Um, your brain grows from the back to the front. It's a pruning process. Uh, the blue areas show brain development, right? So um, 
the front of your brain, oh, got to point it at that, is what I call the Jiminy Cricket part of your brain. It's the part of your brain that's responsible for telling you not to do stupid stuff. Kids actually do not have this part of their brain. They literally don't have it, functionally don't have that part of their brain. Age 22 for girls, their brain is 20, fully developed, and age 24 for boys. So your son, who's 10, is not going to have a fully developed brain until he's 24, on average. Um, and so if you put drugs and alcohol into the mix before your brain is fully developed, it affects you more than if you're just an adult doing them, right? This is another example. Um, how do drugs work? This is a, one of those complicated blah, blah, blah slides. But it, they work because they release uh, chemical messengers into your brain. It's not magic. It's just science. Uh, Google it later for more information. Okay, but um, there. This is what a brain cell, a neurotransmitter looks like, nerve cells in your brain. Um, not actual size. And then this part right here in between is called the synapsis. And what happens is those are chemical messengers that go back and forth. So they send a message through all of your neurotransmitters. And when you do a drug, it makes more of certain chemicals. So you'll feel up or you'll feel down. And that's how drugs work. Um, kind of takes some of the mystery out of it. I can't spend too much time on it, unfortunately. No, this is not rotten teeth. This is supposed to be a video of chemical messengers going back and forth between the, the synapse, but the video doesn't work on this slide. But it's pretty cool. Um, okay, the next one. All right, are you ready to start talking about drugs? All right. Uh, like I said earlier, the slides will be available if you want to spend more time on them. We're going to spend time talking about all of these. First one that we're going to talk about is nicotine. Um, I'm a former smoker myself. I don't know about you guys. Christine is a former smoker, right? Um, nicotine is a drug. It's a stimulant. And it's responsible for, um, it's a leading cause of preventable disease, disability, and death in the United States. Uh, it, there's some statistics for you that you can look at. This is what smoking used to look like, a cigarette. This is what most smoking mostly looks like now, vape very popular. These are some different kinds, of, different ways to smoke. Nicotine comes from a plant, um, for those of you that didn't know that. And then uh, these are some various different kinds of tobacco. So the, the thing that you're ingesting is the nicotine, right? All these things are a nicotine delivery system to deliver nicotine into your body. So some examples are cigarettes. This is um, Swishers. It's a cigar. Um, the jewel pods, and then that's some of the juice that goes inside of the chargeable ones, sort of like that. This is actually one, if you're going to ingest nicotine, this is probably the best way to do it. These are nicotine pouches that you just put in your mouth. So you don't get lung cancer, you just get mouth cancer. But um, it's one of the less harmful ways to smoke. A couple of laws that changed when my kids were teenagers was... Um, in 2016, they changed the law that you could no longer buy any of these products unless you were 21. And then um, a law that passed in 2022, which as a libertarian, I don't understand why they have to make things a law. But 76% um, of people thought that if they just took flavored stuff off the market, that less people would smoke and less, be less appealing to children. So that's why you can no longer buy um, these swishers that have different flavors and you can't buy um, anything with flavor anymore, not even menthols, just straight cigarettes. Okay, nicotine is a stimulant. Here are the things that it does. Those are the different chemicals it releases in your brain. All right, and then if anybody's ever stopped smoking, you know that you do get a little bit of withdrawal. You get cranky, um, irritable, anxiety problems, concentrating, restlessness, but... It's always best to smoke and set the good example, right? Uh, okay, any questions about nicotine, smoking? No? All right. Next one we're going to talk about is alcohol. Um, legal and cheap. It's always amazed me that alcohol is, not that I think it should be illegal, but you can literally go into the store and buy something that can kill you if you drink enough of it. It can also kill you if you stop drinking, 
um, if you drank enough. So um, let's see. Oops, I think I skipped some. All right, there we go. Some statistics about alcohol. This is the one that concerns me the most right here, binge drinking when it comes to kids. Because a lot of kids, maybe they've avoided drinking their whole life, never touched a beer. They go off to college and it's all about shots, shots, shots. So what we're trying to avoid is um, this, binge drinking. These are a couple different definitions of binge drinking. Um, four or more drinks in a couple of hours, five or more for men. Um, Binge drinking is what college students do because during the week they're studying, then they cut loose on the weekends and they drink, drink, drink. And it's very dangerous to not know what your limits are. All right. Um, can you die from drinking? Yes. You can die if you drink too much. Can you die from alcohol withdrawal? Yes, you can. Um, alcohol, we've both dealt with people who are withdrawing from alcohol before. If you're a severe alcoholic, you can get very bad shakes and throw up and it's very miserable and you can actually have a seizure and you can die. So uh, luckily none of your kids are at the level where they're addicted, hopefully to alcohol. They're just trying it, right? But when you try anything, you need to know, um, well, we'll talk about this first. So you've all heard of 0.08, 0.08, you're legally drunk. These are the different zones. When you've had a couple drinks, you're in this zone with one, this with two, it goes higher and higher and higher. Uh, I once breathalyzed a client that had a blood alcohol of 0.4 something, and he was walking and talking. I would be dead if my blood alcohol was that high, but um, he was a very severe alcoholic, so he he was fine with it. I was I was astounded. I still talk about it to this day. You've all seen this before, right? This is what comes with your driver's license because uh, they'd want you to know what your blood alcohol is for your size. This is true for most people. As you can see, men and women are different. Men metabolize alcohol differently than women do. Um, so it kind of gives you a guideline, like if you've had one in an hour, this is how drunk you are. And then it goes up and up and up. And the reason this is very important to know is because you don't want to drive when you've been drinking because it's not too hard to get a .08. It could be like three drinks, right? Um, but you have to know what is a drink, like what is a serving. So this slide talks about this is how many servings until you're drunk. But if you're drinking a huge glass of wine like this lady, does that mean she's only having one drink? Does people will rationalize and tell themselves that there's a serving size on everything. All these snacks on the table have a serving size, right? But a lot of people don't know what a serving of alcohol is. A serving is... Um, the proof is twice the alcohol by volume and everything that you drink will say on the front of it what the proof is and what the alcohol by volume is. So you just have to look and do a little bit of math. Um, here's an average, and this is really important for kids to know because if your kids are drinking out of a bottle and they think a bottle is one drink, there's a very high chance that they're gonna get extremely intoxicated. They need to know that it's not by the container, it's by the amount of alcohol volume and the size of the, the drink. So here's some examples. Oops, that's the, all right. This examples of standard drinks. Did you know this about the red Solo cup? Did you know that it has different serving sizes on it? Anyway, um, so uh, these are typical servings. 12 ounce bottle of beer, five ounce glass of wine, which is not very much. Um, a shot, you know, gets progressively smaller. So these are some examples. And this is really good for grownups to know too, not just kids. Um, and I would love to, I teach a class to kids about safe drinking on the assumption that they're going to drink, especially when they go to college. And I just want them to know this is a serving, and if you're drinking this much, you're going to get drunk. So pace yourself, drink water, know what a serving side is. Very important to know. Okay. Um, this side I'm going to slip over, but please go back and read it. It's about alcohol and things that can happen when you drink too much. And something to, how can you avoid having your kids look like these? These are actual pictures from the internet. Um, this is what we want to avoid our kids looking like. And... How can, well, first of all, any questions about alcohol before we move on? Everybody good with that? Okay. 
Here's some things that you can do to help your kids not end up like the kids in this picture. Keep the communication open with your kids about alcohol. And if they tell you something, don't freak out and get mad because they will never tell you anything again. Um, Talk to your daughters and your sons about partying and sexual assault. Personal story doesn't mean that I have a personal story about sexual assault, but I took the opportunity when my son and his friends were in the car when they were teenagers to talk about the whole Stanford thing and like, if a girl's asleep, that doesn't mean yes, you know, that kind of thing. So talk to your sons and your daughters about this. Um, Make sure they're educated on safe drinking limits. You can show them the slides that I just showed you. Uh, Let them know they can always call you in an emergency, right? And then when they call you, don't get mad. (laughs) because you want them to call you in an emergency. This includes if they're with friends that drink or um, maybe the friend's parents had too much to drink and they call you. Make sure that your kid has access to a rideshare app, Uber or Lyft on their phone, which is on your credit card in case there's an emergency they can get home. And if they're older and they're out clubbing and they're going off to college, consider buying them a breathalyzer. They're not that expensive. They can use it, make sure they haven't had too much to drink. They can use it on their friends. Um, just some good, some good tips for you. All right, barbiturates we're not going to talk about because it's a super old drug that's not really around anymore. This is really all you need to know about barbiturates. That's, that's the drug that he used to use to sedate people, sedate women. But there is a drug that's very similar to barbiturates, and that is benzos, um, which is commonly called Xanax or Valium. It's a prescription drug. It's extremely addictive. There's some different brands that you may have heard from, heard before. Librium is actually something that they give people in rehab when they're kicking alcohol. They give them the Librium because they can medically control the taper um, because you can't slowly drink less when you're in rehab. This is kind of like alcohol in, in a pill form, right? So they'll give people Librium, they'll taper them off the alcohol and they won't have a seizure. So actually Xanax, benzos and alcohol are very similar One's liquid and one's a pill. Um, Very popular with teenagers. This is what they give benzos for a a number of different um, medical and and mental health disorders. Uh, They give it out a lot for anxiety. I saw a commercial. You can get it on an app now, some doctor app. Oh, I feel sad. I'm anxious. We'll send you a pill in the mail. It's kind of sad, really, um, how easy it is to get them. And then... These are some short-term use effects and some long-term use effects. They're extremely addictive, and 30% of all prescription drug overdoses are because of these pills. And there's a lot of counterfeit pills. So kids are buying what they think is a Xanax bar, and it turns out that it's made in China, and it has fentanyl in it, and they die. Um, very concerning. This is what they look like. These are some different kinds of pills. That's what they call bars. Um, two different colors, that's a Valium, those are Xanax. Um, withdrawal, like alcohol, is very dangerous. You can have seizures, you can die. Um, okay, any questions about Xanax or benzodiazepines? Everybody good? Okay, um, these are just some things to watch out for because they're similar. Sedative hypnotics, if any of you were taking any of these to help you sleep, just remember that they are very addictive and some cases people will drive and not remember, or at least do stupid tweets that you don't remember. Um, that can happen too. Okay, next drug that we're going to talk about is stimulants. Cocaine, methamphetamine, amphetamine, and caffeine. Those are the effects of it. Here are some examples of caffeine. I'm sure you're all familiar with caffeine. I know this is my favorite drug. Caffeine. I have it every day. I'm addicted. I admit it. Um, I drink coffee, monster energy drinks. I would not let my kids, I was a pretty lax parent, but I would not let my kids drink these because they're crap. They're total garbage. Um, Oh, that's another thing. I'm very, uh, I'm a very open, honest person, and I try really hard not to swear now that I work at a church. So, um, but sometimes I will say crap. So, sorry. Anyway, um, so these are all different kinds of caffeine. And then this is the next stimulant. These are the ones that they give your kid. You have a kid that jumps on the couch a lot and is hyper at school, and the teacher says, your kid needs medication. This is what they're talking about. Your kid probably 
doesn't need medication. This was like very popular just to medicate people 10, 15 years ago. I think they're kind of moving away from that now. But uh, a lot of kids became amphetamine addicts because of these as adults. And then we see them and treat them when they're older, right? All the little ADD, ADD, ADD kids. Yeah, they, they grow out of it, they stop taking it, and then they start taking illegal amphetamines, which we're going to talk about next. Very hard to get a prescription for these as an adult because they just assume that you're an addict, but they made you an addict by giving them to you when you were a kid. It's a vicious circle. All right. <clears throat> this is cocaine. It comes from a plant. It comes from this area of the world, South America. This is the process of making it from this beautiful plant into this cocaine right here is what it commonly looks like. Um, yes, it did used to be in Coca-Cola, that is true, until I think 1905, um, there was cocoa leaves in it, so true story. All right, um, and then the most harmful kind of cocaine is this one, crack cocaine right here. Uh, anyone can get addicted to it, it's extremely addictive. Anybody know who this is? Anybody? Who is it? It's Hunter Biden. Yes, Hunter Biden smoking a crack pipe. So um, it doesn't matter like what family you're from or anything. Cocaine is extremely addictive and you can get addicted to it. Just like Hunter. Um, that's a crack pipe right there. And then crack is cocaine in rock form, whereas powdered cocaine is that. All right. Next slide is about methamphetamine. Um, anybody watch Breaking Bad when it was on? Yeah? Okay, a couple people. So um, that's, this is what nice clean meth looks like up here. But um, this is meth mouth that comes from smoking it, dries out your salivary glands, sucks out all the nutrients out of your body, and you end up with teeth like that. Um, there's different ways to use meth. There we go. This is what a meth lab looks like on TV, nice and clean and shiny with German scientists. And this is what a real meth lab looks like, somebody's bathtub or garage or in a coal mine or something like that. It's um, not pure and clean. Uh, meth can be made anywhere. It can be made in a hotel room. It can be made, it can be imported. It's uh, synthetic, totally synthetic. So you just make it from different chemicals. Um, all right, any questions about stimulants? or methamphetamine? Anybody? Okay. All right, good. Um, let's see. Opium next. Heroin, right? Opium, uh, heroin originally comes from this beautiful flower right here, the opium poppy, uh, primarily made in Afghanistan and other foreign countries in Mexico and imported. Um, it's one of those ones that's made from a plant and then synthesized into something else. Uh, and then these are some drugs that come from the opium poppy. A lot of these, these are prescription drugs, morphine, demerol, codeine, fentanyl, and methadone. Um, these are some names for it. I don't know. Have you ever heard anyone call it horse, Christina? I, I haven't really, I've heard it. Dope and dope. Yeah, I've heard, I hear dope, but not really. Yeah, I don't think anyone says horse. And then there's something called a uh, desomorphine, which is crocodile. Uh, it was on the news a few years back. It's like this flesh-eating bacteria, opiate that people, it was originally in Russia, and people just were continuing to do it, even though their skin was rotting. This is one of the tamer pictures. There's some really gross pictures of like bones and ugh, so disgusting. But people, would, that's just, the, it shows you addiction. Like people get addicted and they just keep doing it, even though there's gross consequences like that. Um, okay, next one. Opiates are prescription. This is oxycodone. If you've ever had any dental work done or anything, um, they probably prescribe this to you. Did you have a question? Yes, I am going to get to that. There absolutely is something going on with fentanyl. That's one of the main reasons I'm here. Um, but good question. So, and uh, interestingly, and this statistic is true because I've taken surveys of clients, most heroin addicts start out with prescription painkillers from the medicine cabinet. They're prescribed it. They can no longer get it because their prescription is flagged. Oh, you've already taken enough of these. So they just start buying heroin off the streets. 
that's how a lot of heroin addicts are born. Um, sad but true. If you would like more information on the pharmaceutical industry, this was a very good movie that was on Hulu called Dope Sick. Um, up until the year the up until the 1990s, the pharmaceutical industry was pushing opiates, lying to doctors and lying to patients about them being addictive. And this didn't happen in like 1930. This was in the 90s, right? It wasn't until people started dying that they became accountable for it. And even then they fought it like, no, it's not our fault. It's not addictive. It's a wonderful drug. Um, very interesting movie. So watch that if you want to know more about how they lied to us all those years. Uh, that's, and that's pharmaceutical opiates. Heroin is, um, oh, these are the effects that you get from it. These are a couple famous people that have done heroin. There's tons of them. I just picked some from my era. John Belushi, who died from it, and then Keith Richards, who shockingly is still alive and has done heroin almost his whole life, probably because he gets good pure heroin that's not cut with anything. Um, but so these are the bad effects and the good effects. Um, and then you, I could probably put a hundred people up here that have died of overdose, but all right. Um, so these are the statistics of overdose deaths in 2020. So during the time that I'm doing this presentation, like 18 more people will die of opiate overdose. Like as I'm talking, oh, there's another one. Oh, there's another one. Like it's bad. Um, and then, as I stated earlier, it got a lot worse during COVID, more and more because of the isolation. And we'll talk about that later. But more and more became, people became addicted and had mental health issues during COVID. Um, these are some of the effects. Uh, or the withdrawals are really bad from opiates. You will not die of opiate withdrawals, but you will feel like you want to die because it feels like the worst flu that you ever had. Um, people are given methadone and stuff like that to make their withdrawals easier. It's very, very painful when you're withdrawing from opiates. It's like the worst flu that you've ever had from what I hear. Um, okay. Any questions about opiates with the exception of fentanyl, which we're going to talk about? All right. Okay, so fentanyl is a synthetic opioid, so it doesn't come from the opium poppy. It's man-made. Um, it's used for treating severe pain, like my mom had surgery and they gave it to her before she had her surgery. So it does have a medical use. It's 50 to 100 times more potent than morphine. Um, it's, and these are some ways that it's prescribed to people, pills, patches, swabs, um, et cetera. So illicitly manufactured fentanyl is the problem right now because it can be put in almost anything. So kids are buying, they're buying cocaine or meth or ecstasy or Xanax, and they're, they're made in a different country, usually China, and imported, and they have fentanyl in them. So the kids are unknowingly taking fentanyl when they think they're taking something else. It's very, very powerful. It can be mixed with any other drug. And... Um, often deceptively, unpurposely made to look like another drug. And people are unaware that it's in there. So that's how they're dying. Um, this is where most fentanyl is coming from China. Uh, the CCP does not care about the health of Americans. Um, that's the primary source and it's trafficked in and that's from the DEA. This is like a regular pill. And this is, I mean, you can't tell the difference. They look exactly the same is the problem. Um, and so right when you thought this is the worst thing that can possibly be out there, there's car fentanyl, <laughs> um, which is an elephant tranquilizer, which is, this is, gives you an idea. This is heroin, how much it takes to kill you. This is fentanyl. This is car fentanyl. It's 10,000 times more potent than morphine. And it's used to immobilize elephants and other large animals. But somebody thought it would be a great idea to put it in drugs. And the reason they do that is because it makes the drugs more addictive and then people want more, right? 
because um, they get physically addicted. So and we are going to talk more about fentanyl. Um, these are some slides from a recent article that was in this, uh, the Mercury News, and it's about Narcan. This is Narcan. This will save you if you overdose on fentanyl. This will save a kid. It is a nasal spray. It is extremely easy to give to somebody. If you suspect somebody's overdosed, you spray it into their nose. And if it doesn't work, you spray the other one into their nose. Very easy, no liability, good Samaritan law. If they have not overdosed on fentanyl, if it's something else, it will not hurt them, okay? And Chris was here earlier. He's a school board president. He was instrumental in getting fentanyl put into Milpitas Unified School District and into our schools and training teachers on how to use it. If you are in San Jose, anybody, in, kids in San Jose Unified? Okay, if you spread the word, if you're a San Jose Unified School District, they are still hesitant to put this in schools. Oh, what about liability? What about this? What about that? No, just put it in there. You know, the school nurse can have it, the teachers can have it, and if a kid overdoses, and it's already saved kids in Santa Clara County. It's literally saved kids already. Um, you can pick this up free at a pharmacy. There's also information back there from the harm reduction center that Christina bought. You can call them. You can get. I carry some of my car. I carry some of my purse because I never know when I'm going to run across somebody that's overdosed and I can spray it, you know. Um, so I suggest if you live in San Jose that you call and email your school board members and get them to get this in your schools right now because it could save somebody's life and it has saved lives. Um, okay. Any questions? about opiates, fentanyl, anything else? Okay. Marijuana. I say, finally a nice drug. But I mean, realistically, marijuana has not killed anyone. I stay up on this statistic. I check every few months, and has anyone died of marijuana? No one has died of a marijuana overdose ever. Okay, you can Google that if you want. There was one kid that like ate a bunch of edibles, but... There's actually two different schools of thought on what actually killed him. But um, so that's Tally from South Park. Anyway, people try marijuana because it does have a medical use. Um, it's also a recreational drug now. Uh, it's legal in California. Most people smoke marijuana because they want to get high or they want to kill pain. They want to feel better. The problem is that nowadays... Like back in high school when I smoked marijuana, I know, <clears throat> it was like 5% THC. Now it's like 95%. It's super strong, super strong now. Um, uh, cannabis does have medical use. It's like an herbal, it's a plant, all right? And people use it for all different kinds of things listed here. Uh, not very hard to get a medical marijuana card. All you really have to have is $40. Not relevant anymore because it's legal for recreational use anyway. So it's not a big deal anymore in California. Huh? Oh, DJ, don't let me lose the screen. Okay. Um, these are the effects of cannabis. The um, effects last three to four hours. It says tolerance develops quickly. I mean, it depends on how much you smoke. Um, and keep in mind, I'm talking about kids. You guys can smoke all the cannabis you want, but you don't want your kids smoking cannabis because their brains are still developing, right? Um, okay. Does quitting cannabis cause withdrawal? No. I mean, a little bit, like with quitting smoking, irritability, trouble sleeping, stuff like that. Has anyone ever died from marijuana? As of 2023, when I looked this up a couple weeks ago, no. These are the states where marijuana is legal. Um, and then the lighter green states, it's legal for medical use. Um, and then the orange states, still working on it. Predictions for the near future, apparently, everybody except Texas and Kansas, and because that's West Virginia. Um, how does people use THC? I think most of us know how THC is used, but I just wanted to show you a comparison. So this is your grandpa right here, back in the 70s, smoking a joint with his friends. Um, this stuff right here, these little crystals, that's the THC. That's what gets you high for marijuana. So the more crystals there are, the higher it will get you. It used to look like this. Now it looks like this, and it's very strong. And now they have this stuff, which is the wax, um, which is like concentrated weed, really super strong, like ridiculous. That's what it looks like a lot now. Um, so this is um, different ways that you can ingest marijuana. 
As you can see, if now if you or if someone you know uses edibles and you have small children in your house, just remember that these look exactly like regular candy, right? So the kids, there have been cases of kids eating edible gummies and then having to go to the hospital. Um, this is a vape. I brought a couple with me. It's okay. These have CBD in them. Um, but this is what a vape pen looks like if anybody wants to look at that later. And then this is the, what I consider ridiculous way to smoke it, which is a bubbler or a pipe with the wax. It's silly. I mean, if you have to smoke marijuana that's 95% THC, maybe it's time to stop for a little while. That's my thought on it anyway. All right. Um, so marijuana is a plant, comes from a plant. There's something called spice or K2. If you want to amuse yourself, go to YouTube and type in tripping out on spice and you'll see all sorts of videos of kids freaking out smoking spice. Basically what it is is a, like potpourri with chemicals sprayed on it and the chemicals are what get you high. Um, bad stuff. And you could buy it in a head shop, or what they call a smoke shop now. Um, you can just go in and buy spice. So... All right, so CBD, which is what I have in these, is um, cannabidiol, which does not have THC in it. So it has some of the same effects as far as I use it for anxiety and relaxation. It does not get you high. CBD is very popular now. It's in everything. It's in gummies. It's essential oils. Has uh, Young Living has CBD. CBD is everywhere. CBD is fine. CBD is not going to get you high. Um, but it does come from a same cannabis plant. Okay. Time to stretch. Uh, yes. Is that still considered for the brain development? Um, not so much. I mean, if my kid had like anxiety, I would rather have them taking CBD than taking Xanax. <laughs> you know? Um, no, children can take it. They have CBD for kids too, I think. But it does not, it has no psychoactive effects as far as making you high. But good question. Okay, so nobody needs to stretch. All right, so it's not 7.30 yet, so I'm doing pretty good. All right, hallucinogens and psychedelics. Ooh, ever take time to enjoy the graphic? Um, so there's different kinds of hallucinogens and psychedelics. Um, these are the ones that come from plants, right? There's a million things in nature that can get you high. I've been studying herbs and... There's, I mean, all sorts of different plants will get you high, right? If you know how to ingest them. But these are some of the major ones. LSD, which is made from a fungus. And psilocybin mushrooms, peyote, which is a cactus. Salvia, which is, it looks like mint, right? Um, it's in the mint family. And then ayahuasca is very popular right now, actually, with people that just want to trip once in a while and then go back to their day jobs um, doing ayahuasca for like a spiritual thing. Um, LSD, you don't you actually eat the fungus. It's made into a, oops, anyway, it's made into a liquid. You can put it on anything, candy, anything. Um, then there's, synth let me make sure I didn't miss one. Then there's synthetic hallucinogens, which are a little more dangerous, well, or a lot more dangerous. Um, I had not heard of Dom until I borrowed Anyway, DJ had the slideshow from a class. And I was like, oh, I got to look that one up. But it sounds awful because it lasts 30 hours. 30 hours of tripping, no thanks. Um, and then something called NBOM, which is similar to LSD. So these are, they get the same sort of hallucinogenic effects, but they are synthetic. All right. And then um, these the kind of things that you see if you've never taken LSD. I won't ask for a show of hands because, you know. I don't care what you do in your spare time. But um, this is something that you might, might see when you're... So as far as hallucinations is different from a delusion. Delusion's more like you look like a kangaroo, but I'm not seeing a kangaroo that's not there, but you look like a kangaroo, right? Um, and those are some of the effects. And um, some of the bad effects are nausea and vomiting, distortions, having a bad trip. So hallucinogens are very dependent upon the environment in which you take them, which is why people can take ayahuasca mushrooms with like a shaman or something and have a spiritual experience. A lot of times it's used in religious ceremonies, become closer to the universe and all that. Um, and everything's fine. But then if you take LSD and you watch like the Saw movies or something, or, you know, do something scary or, or somebody makes you mad or scares you while you're taking it, then it can really ruin the whole thing. So it's very dependent on 
um, environment and mood that you're in. This I got off the internet. It's like pointers for taking hallucinogens if you want to have a good trip. Follow these guidelines. And I mean, they're true. I've I've done a lot of drugs, just as a disclaimer. I haven't done any drugs since 1995, with the exception of trying marijuana when I had cancer and alcohol. But um, I got sober in 1995 from meth. And I hadn't taken any hallucinogens lately, but I did like high school, college years, right? Um, I survived. But I can really see how it would be scary for a lot of people, you know, because it lasts so long, too. Uh, this is how long some of them last. This is some of the artwork created by people who had taken hallucinogens. It does bring out a certain artistic side in some people if they're not freaking out and staring in their garbage disposal. Um, okay, and then this is another synthetic uh, sort of hallucinogen. Anybody ever heard of angel dust? It was popular in like the 70s and 80s. Um, so it is... Um, one of those things here, let me just go to the next slide. It'll be more descriptive. So these are some headlines from actual people that were on PCP. Usually it involves nudity, police, and somebody thinking they have some sort of superhuman strength. So like the police will taste somebody and they can't feel it. It, it disassociative, it, connects your, it disconnects your brain from your body so you don't like feel anything. Very scary drug. Mm, tried it once, did not like it. Um, thankfully not very popular right now, um, but, some, but there is something similar that's popular, which we'll go to next, called Trank, and it was recently on the news. So I had to look it up because I'd never heard of it. It's xylazine, and uh, Trank is short for tranquilizer. It's an op a non-opiate sedative, and um, it's called the zombie drug, and the picture is an example of some people that were on Trank and ending up in the hospital. Started in Puerto Rico and then came here in the 2000s and now it's here. So uh, look up some more information about that. Uh, something similar to Trank that was popular maybe during the Obama administration, bath salts. Anybody heard of that? So it's not the kind of lovely bath salts here that you put in your bath. It's like $10 for this whole jar. It was actually available in smoke shops. It was legal you go in and buy it, and um, Obama administration made it illegal. So, and the way the way synthetic chemicals work is, it's like a cake. You have a recipe for it: two eggs and two cups of flour and a cup of sugar. And then they say, "Okay, well that recipe is illegal. You can't do it anymore." So then they'll say, "Okay, well here we'll just use one egg." And then they put it back on the market. I mean, I'm not a scientist, but I'm so I'm using the cake as an example, but um, that's how they keep cycling back around. They'll rename it something else and remarket it. Um, that's the thing about synthetic. So do you remember the guy that got his face eaten? Okay, you can look that up. I won't show you the after picture, but this poor guy right here got his face eaten off by this guy who was on bath salts. And now he has like no eyes, no nose. Um, I think he's Christian now and plays guitar. Uh, but anyway, it was a horrible story, and, and there was more like stuff on the news about people running around naked and biting people, and that was bath salts. All right, thankfully not popular now. Uh, okay, I didn't want to show you the after picture because it's really gross. MDMA, also called ecstasy uh, or molly. This is a very popular drug um, at raves and parties. I went to a rave with my daughter a couple of years ago, sober, um, at Shoreline, just for the whole experience. And I would say 90% of the people at a rave are taking this or some drug, right? Um, and it enhances the music or it's just very popular drug. So, I mean, if your kids are into listening to this techno music, chances are if they go to one of the concerts, they're going to be exposed to Molly at some point. So it's important for them to know how to be safe. Um, luckily, there's an upside to raves. It's a very... So these are the, the bad effects that can happen. The rave culture is very um, protective of each other. So, I mean, if there's an upside to taking Molly... 
that's what it is. The, the, the environment, having been in it myself observing, everybody takes care of each other and it's like, you know, I don't want to say it's safe, but it's, they have medical there. They have people that help you if you're tripping. They have, they keep you hydrated. They have, you know, it's very, I don't know. This is a, it's a culture. It's a culture. Um, and then there's some other club drugs, GHB, uh, which used to be sold in health food stores and was legal. And then ketamine, special K, um, total garbage. This is an actual meme. I, I like memes. I'm a meme person, but um, there's something called getting stuck in a K-hole when you take ketamine where you'd like to stuck there and you can't move. Sounds great, right? But still popular. Um, so, I mean, if, if I had to pick one of these like um, my, my kid says, I'm going to go to a rave. I'm going to take one of these. I'd be like, okay, I guess that one. I mean, I don't know. Only because, I don't know, only because of the culture, you know? Um, the problem is that a lot of times the molly has fentanyl in it, right? So you can get test kits at the same harm reduction clinic that will give you this Narcan and your kids can test their drugs and make sure they don't have fentanyl in them, which I know we don't want our kids taking drugs. Ideally, don't take any drugs at all. But if you're going to take drugs, you can order test kits on the internet. You can get them from the harm reduction clinic, and they can at least test them and make sure it's actually what it's supposed to be and not fentanyl. Yeah, I know the things we think of after, right? All right. Um, anyway, those are the other club drugs. Okay. Any questions about ecstasy, club drugs, anything like that? All right. Inhalants are things that are found in your house. A pam, a spray pam, right, that you spray your, your pans with. Um, white out, glue, felt tip markers, aerosols are some different examples. Has anybody ever done whippets with the whipped cream? Come on now. Anybody? Not come. Nobody? All right, me neither. Um, so the nitrous oxide that is in the can, that's a propellant. If you, if you snort it, it'll make you all lightheaded. <laughs> um, put, cuts off the oxygen to your brain real quick, like 30 second high. But a lot of kids start out with stuff that you find in your house, getting high off, but snorting it. Um, and, and even like the stuff you use to clean your keyboard. All right, spray paint. That's why the spray paint is locked up now at Home Depot is because kids would steal it, spray it in a paper bag and huff it. It's called huffing. Um, this is from Airplane and I'm dating myself, but uh, there is something called sudden sniffing death, the 100 to 125 deaths annually, but it doesn't sound like a lot compared to like fentanyl, but if it's your kid, you know, um, and the reason it's so appealing is because it's legal, cheap, and easy to find. Because you don't expect that your kid is going to get high from your keyboard cleaning spray, but you can. Okay, next one. Um, any questions about huffing or sniffing? Okay. Over-the-counter medication. This is the reason why you have to have ID to buy cold medicine now is um, anything with the word DXM or D, DX or, yeah, XM in it is um, dextromethorphan, I think, uh, Robitussin. If you drink a lot of it, it'll get you high. And if you take the one teaspoon or whatever you're supposed to take, it's fine. But if you drink the whole bottle, you will get high from it. Um, this became popular with the rap culture, with the lean or purple drink where you would put some Sprite, some cough medicine, and a Jolly Rancher and make a drink. It was very popular with this guy, Lil Wayne, who recently stopped drinking it because he almost died. Um, but that's another cheap way that kids get high is from cough medicine. So I guess you ought to all go home and mark your bottles with the Sharpie and make sure that they're not getting lower. Um, okay, so the good news is, DJ, it's 728, and we have done all the drugs. We have talked about all of them. Yay! <laughs> yes, thank you. I do talk really fast. So, um, yeah, we pretty much talked about all of them. So during the course of our discussing different drugs, did anything come up for anybody? Does any, anybody have any questions now looking back that I didn't cover? Yes.
So that's a, that's a good question. Um, street drugs are, it depends on the drug, but for example, cocaine, back when I used to do cocaine in the 90s, 80s and 90s, was like $20, and it's still $20. It's like cheap, drugs are cheap, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, Chris, in a worst case scenario, check your wallets. Yeah. But no, that's true. Initially, a lot, initially, when your kids first take drugs, they're probably going to be offered them for free. You know, at a party, at a concert, something like that. Most kids will start out with smoking cigarettes, drinking, smoking marijuana. Because it's the low-hanging fruit. It's the easy thing to get, right? And then they'll be at a party with kids that are doing this and that. And that one guy shows up that's like 10 years older than everybody else, somebody's older brother or whatever. And he's got all the other drugs and, you know, it gets offered. And that's usually how kids start doing harder drugs. Um, so, yeah, drugs are not expensive. Marijuana, for example, you can... I They, they have signs off the side of the freeway now. It's like... Uh, what is it, like a $90, $80 ounce or something like that? I'm like, what? Marijuana used to be like $300 an ounce. Now it's cheap. Now to go to a club, you have to, have, you have to be 21, and you, have, you don't have to have uh, a card anymore in California. But you have to be 21 to go in, like a bar. Um, but marijuana is cheap, and a lot of people grow it, and it's inexpensive. And um, So drugs are not expensive. Um, club drugs probably one pill is like $20 for club drugs. So, yeah, they have not gotten any more expensive over the years, which astounds me. They're the same price they were 30 years ago. You know, another thing that parents can tell your teenager, or, you know, hopefully not a teenager, but, you know, we're not in denial here, but you can tell them if they are going to be drinking, you know, to cover their drinks, to keep their drinks, because that's where, you know, and but now his methamphetamine clients, and they thought they smoked cocaine, but they actually had methamphetamine, amphetamine, cocaine, MDMA, and fentanyl. Yeah, everything's, everything's mixed with everything these days. That's true. What do you mean I tested positive for opiates? I, yeah. We're going to talk about safety actually coming up. That is a good one. Your kids start going to parties, especially your daughters. Don't take something that's already open. Don't let somebody make you a drink. Bring your own booze, drink something with a lid on it, watch somebody open it um, because they can put anything in your drink. Um, even for, for boys too, not just girls, happens to men too. But um, yes, we are gonna talk about that in the safety portion. But does that answer your question about the cost? Yeah, drugs are cheap, they're cheap. Not expensive at all. Um, Mm -hmm. What do you recommend? Taking child seeking. Well, I mean, I have lost my faith in doctors because of the opiate crisis. Okay. And because seeing clients come in addicted to different things that they were given to by a doctor, just because somebody is a doctor doesn't mean they know the best thing for your child. Right. And there are, um, if, for example, my child had ADHD or anxiety, I would try other natural things before I would get my kid a prescription. I would just try like everything I could except for that. And then if nothing else works, try that last because they are addictive drugs. They are. ADHD medication is a stimulant. Stuff they give for you for anxiety is a benzo. It's all very addictive. Um, I would try CBD. I would try, you know, feedback, biofeedback. I would try, um, you know, all the other natural uh, herbal remedies, whatever, before I would get my kid given an addictive drug. Because they were giving them so freely. When my, my youngest one was in school, so many kids were on ADHD meds. If you've ever been on, like, one of our mission trips where it's like, oh, hey, here's my kid's prescription to give them while they're... Good Lord, like half these kids are taking meds all day long. So it's really, you know your kid better than anybody else, right? 
And, um, and I'm not a doctor, but also doctors don't know your kid as well as you do. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, well, and I think they're also. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, tell your doctor I want the least addicting thing for my kid. And I really would try this CBD. It's, it's gotten very popular. I use it. My husband has never touched a drug in his life uses CBD, um, and it's, you know, it's relaxing. It helps a lot of things, and it won't get you high. So, um, okay, some of your questions might be answered coming up. How do I keep my kid from using drugs? Well, if I knew the answer to this question, I would be a bazillionaire <laughs> going to parties with Elon um, because all kids are different, right? They're all different. Um, and there's no magic formula for making sure your kid never uses drugs. And even if they don't use drugs when they're younger, when they get to be college age, you want them to be informed because they're probably going to use drugs at some point, and ignorance is not bliss when it comes to drugs. Right? You need to be informed. Um, but some things that might help. So this is the wheel of addiction, this is people that don't take any drugs at all. This is experimental stage. And this is where probably most of your kids are going to stay. Taking a drug out of curiosity, trying it, um, drinking. Oh, bye. Thank you. Thank you. Got to go. Um, bye, Christina. Um, trying something at parties. You know, drinking alcohol, smoking weed. And then it might be a little more social, social use. And then starts to become regular and then this asterisk I assume means like danger um, and then harmful use means it starts to interfere with your life your hobbies your interests stops you from doing things you enjoy uh, maybe you want to stop but can't stop and then dependent use is you gotta have it right and then hopefully at that point you get into recovery but most of your kids honestly are going to linger around here somewhere experimenting and doing drugs socially, especially as they get older. It's unavoidable unless your kid is locked in a room, which we did during COVID and people still got high, right? So it doesn't stop anybody. Um, these are the seven stages of addiction in a little bit different format. So initially they're offered something, they start experimenting with their friends, they start using regularly, they start doing risky things, you know, getting drugs off the streets from risky people, driving, etc. cetera. Um, then they might become dependent, which is this guy here. And then hopefully at that time when they're addicted, you have a kind of relationship with them where they can tell you that they're having an issue and you can help them by getting them into rehab. Unfortunately, many parents are surprised. I've talked to parents who knew that I was a drug counselor from church you know, church is not like this insulated, my kids are never going to use drugs because I go to church. It helps, but it's not, it's one of the protective factors, but it's no guarantee um, because your kids are going to go out in the world. And drugs are out there everywhere. So have them take my class. Um, all right. And then these are some factors that will increase the risk of addiction. If you have these factors in your family, genetics plays a part. You're not doomed if your parents are alcoholic and your grandparents are alcoholic and you have alcoholics in your family. That doesn't mean that you're going to become an alcoholic, but it is, there is a genetic component to it. It doesn't mean that you're doomed, right? Um, environment is very important. How you grow up, are you growing up with sober people? Are you growing up seeing people that can handle life on life's terms without using? Right? What is your environment like? Um, what is their environment like? Stressful home life. Just like us, our kids get stressed out. They got school, they got social stuff. Everything's stressful when you're 15. Everything's so dramatic, right? Lots of stress. Um, so instead of work, we'll call that school, right? School is stressful. Um, if your child has mental health disorders or is inclined to certain times of medical, um, mental health diagnoses, that increases your chances of trying drugs. And then misuse of drug prescriptions um, being prescribed something and abusing it, whether it's anxiety meds or opiates or whatever. 
So those, those will increase your risk of addiction, their risk of addiction. All right, so um, the other thing that you want to talk to your kids honestly about is the legal question. Of course, we don't want kids doing illegal drugs. They're illegal. Um, so which drugs that we talked about are legal and under what circumstances? We have a little time for a quiz. Um, does anybody remember what some of the legal drugs were? For adults, not for kids, because none of them are legal for kids, right? Alcohol. Alcohol is legal. You can buy it in the store, right? Your kid could run in, steal a bottle, run out. They don't even chase you anymore. They're just like, eh, let them go. Um, marijuana is legal if you're 21 and over. Um, prescription drugs are legal if they are prescribed to you. Right? So if your kid has a prescription, tell them not to be driving around with a pill in their pocket. Right? You need to carry the bottle with you. The bottle needs to have your name on it, not somebody else's name. So a, a legal drug can become an illegal drug if it's not yours, right? if it's not prescribed to you. Uh, it, state laws vary. A lot of things are legal in California or overlooked that are not legal in Texas or other places, you got to take the, the place into consideration. Um, you have to take age into consideration. So when they change the smoking laws from 21 to 18, they automatically made some 19-year-olds criminals because now you're doing something illegal because you're not supposed to be smoking because you're not 21. I don't know how many cops are walking around enforcing smoking. Probably not very many. But the point being, age has a lot to do with it right? You can have two beers when you're 21. Nobody's going to think it's a big deal. If you have two beers and you're 17, the cops can give you a ticket. So discuss the legal ramifications with your kid. Um, driving, of course, is never okay. That's why it's important to have that Uber in place, that emergency plan in place, that willing to give your kid a ride at two in the morning if they need it in place because, um, Kids don't always know their limits and they make bad choices. And then, so take, figure out what the laws are. We discuss some of them and discuss that with your kids. Yes, marijuana is legal, but your 15 is not legal for you, right? Yes, alcohol is legal, but you can't be driving around with alcohol in your car because you're 18, right? Um, you don't want them to get into legal trouble. Um, disclaimer, I'm not a lawyer. I think we all knew that. Okay. Uh, speaking of legalities, this is how drugs are scheduled. So scheduling means, I'll show you this slide. The, the federal government, and I added the ridiculous world of on the top because I'm sarcastic like that, of drug scheduling. So um, this is how certain drugs are more illegal than other drugs. So um, a Schedule I drug has no current medical use and a high potential for abuse. Interestingly, I highlighted some things because I wanted you to see them. In the green where it says LSD, you wouldn't think that that, like what is the medical use for LSD, right? So that's a schedule one drug. They actually are starting to use LSD and, uh, and, and like mushrooms and other hallucinogens in very small doses, micro doses, to treat things like PTSD, um, in adults, you know, soldiers and stuff like that, people who have been through trauma, microdosing, micro meaning small for those of you that don't know. But so it actually does have a medical use. And then marijuana, shockingly, even though it's been proven to have medical use, is still a Schedule One drug. And this is really something that I was hoping would change during the Obama administration because he said, I've smoked weed. Okay, great. So it's unscheduled marijuana. Um, but that didn't happen. Um, the fact that marijuana is still Schedule One drug up there with the other Schedule One drugs like heroin is astounding to me. So write your senator. Um, and then Schedule Two drugs they have a high potential for abuse. They lead to dependence. They're dangerous. And Oxy is lower on the schedule than marijuana. Even though we all know that it's highly addictive and kills lots of people and... Um, it's not as dangerous as marijuana, according to the federal government. Um, and then Schedule Three drugs, low, lower potential for abuse, but still um, 
more than Schedule 4. And then Schedule 4 drugs, I, the things I also highlighted are Xanax and Valium, which we all know are very addictive benzodiazepines that we discussed earlier, are down there in Schedule 4 and marijuana is Schedule 1. Anyway, that's how different drugs are. That's how they decide what laws are made about what drugs. Um, I did not make those laws. I don't know who did back in 1930, but it was somebody that didn't like marijuana. Okay. Um, so this I took from the, it, the workshop that we had last month on trauma-informed care, and these are called protective factors. I thought, hey, those are good protective factors to have your kids avoid using drugs and alcohol too. So if any of these things are present in your home, it decreases your kid's chance of uh, makes them more resilient, decreases their chances of using drugs and alcohol. Um, so safe and stable environment, good social support, parental monitoring. The, your child can see that you can work through conflicts with other people and problems, doing fun, positive activities together, enforcing uh, the importance of school and education. You having a higher level of education and employment is also a protective factor. Consistent family life, et cetera. Um, okay, so since we have time, I want to talk real quick about Rat Park. So back in the um, 70s, or before the 70s, this guy did an experiment with rats, and he put them in a cage, and he gave them like a bottle of water and a bottle of morphine and to see if they would get addicted. Well, of course, the rats hit the morphine button over and over and over and over until they died of overdose. Um, but in the 70s, this guy came along and he said, you know, I have this theory. So he took, um, well, not the same rats because they'd be dead, but he took some rats and he put them in a cage and he gave them drugs and he gave them water. But they also, he also gave them a, a habit trail and toys and other rats to socialize with and mate with and... Um, gave them all sorts of fun things to do. And shockingly, the rats would only hit the morphine bottle once in a while. They didn't get addicted. They didn't use it until they died. So of course, if you're a rat in a cage and you have nothing else to do, you're gonna choose the morphine, right? Um, so the kind of, the, so, so the point of it is, the social community beat the power of addiction. How this can tie into our kids is, does your kid have a good social community? Are they out doing things? Do they have friends? Do they have activities? Are you doing things together? Are you doing church? Are they in youth group? You know, all those things, having things to do and not sitting and doing this all day long and, you know, going out and getting sun and touching grass, all that stuff is a huge protective factor because the rats... Uh, didn't want to use the drugs when they had stuff to do. And they're just rats. So imagine if it was a kid, right? Um, okay, next one. Here's some more strategies. Keeping in mind, I am not the perfect parent, right? These are ideal. I didn't necessarily do all of these. Like I said, I was not a helicopter parent. I was very sort of go make your own mistakes kind of person. Just don't kill anyone or yourself. Um, but so these, but these are definitely some things that would, that I took from the internet that I probably should follow, but my kids are grown now. Anyway, knowing your kids' activities, pay attention to your teen's whereabout, uh, find out what activities your kids is interested in and encourage them to get involved. The rat park thing that we talked about, right? Um, my kids, my two youngest ones, my youngest one is 22. My daughter is 25 now. I still have them on Find Friends on my phone just because I still pay for their phone, right? But like I can look right now, my daughter's in Missouri. I can look and see, oh, she's at the gym. Oh, she's at work. You know, it's just kind of cool. You can always know where your kids are on their phone because they're not going to put this thing down. It's going to be on them at all times, right? Um, you're paying the phone bill. You should be able to know where they are. It's a great GPS tool. Uh, one time my daughter and my son got in an argument. She was driving him somewhere. And he got out of the car and stomped off, and then he didn't know where he was. This is before he had a cell phone. So I was like, okay, well, if he had this GPS tracker, then I would be able to see where he was. He was calling from some gas station. But anyway, so it's always good to have your kids know where your children are. Um, 
establish rules and consequences and agreements, explain your family rules, be clear about what the rules are, right? Don't confuse your kid. It seems like it took me five minutes to drink that water. I know it was just a couple seconds. Anyway, <clears throat> very important one that I highlighted, leaving a party where drug use occurs and not riding with a driver who's been using drugs or alcohol. So <clears throat> you might do a great job with your kid. They don't use drugs or alcohol. They go to the party, they're drinking sodas, you know, but they're with their friend and their friend drove and their friend had a couple of drinks or tried something for the first time. Now their friend's drunk or high and they're dependent on that person for a ride home. Right? So make sure your kid has a way to get home. That's called a, a get home safely plan. Because um, the important thing is we don't want our kids to die. Right? We want to keep them alive until they're adults. And is it really an inconvenience to have to have an Uber ride or go get your kid if their life depends on it? Right? And don't yell at them all the way home. Like, what the heck are you doing going to a party like that? No, just talk about it the next day, give them a ride, and then next day have a conversation, right? Or else they won't call you anymore, right? Um, okay, know who your teen's friends are. If your teen's friends use drugs, then your, your, your teen is going to want to at some point maybe. Um, hate to say it, but keep track of your prescription drugs. If you have a prescription for something and it's in your medicine cabinet, uh, consider keeping it in your safe or something like that. Even your cough syrup now, apparently, you have to keep track of that too. Mm, provide support, offer praise and encouragement. Set a good example. If you drink or you smoke cannabis, um, do so in moderation. Don't do it and drive. Don't have your kids see you doing it all the time. And don't use illicit drugs. I don't think anybody here uses illicit drugs, but... Everybody knows somebody. Everybody has that uncle, that sister, that brother, whatever. Um, okay, next one. Any questions about that? All right. We're making good time. How do I talk to my preteen about drugs? Well, you could go home and you could go through this slideshow with them. And you can say, look at all this cool stuff I learned about. I hope you're not trying this new Trank drug. Have you ever heard of it? You know, go through the slideshow, talk about safe drinking limits, talk about marijuana, um, and you can maybe use that as a catalyst to start a conversation. Ask them their views, avoid lecturing them, um, listen to your teen's opinions and questions. Uh, can your kid be honest with you without getting in trouble? That's important. Uh, a lot of times we go, la, 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 I don't want to know, I don't want to know. But these days with fentanyl, I mean, we just got to protect our kids. You can tell your kids this, look, I know you're going to want to try things, but it's very dangerous right now. Everything has fentanyl in it. Don't take pills. Don't take pills. Don't take pills. Don't, you know, that's, that's like the main thing for me is like, I hate pills and powders. Don't take pills. There's worse things, alcohol, marijuana. That's not going to kill you unless you drink too much. But pills right now can kill you, you know. Um, emphasize. Don't don't use scare tactics except when it comes to fentanyl. I added that because that's a real thing. But the D.A.R.E. program that they give the kids in school did not work. Kids weren't scared of doing drugs because the cops said drugs are bad. Because then they get out there and they smoke pot and they say, hey, this is great. Everybody lied to me about drugs being terrible because they're not always terrible. Sometimes they're fun. Yeah, sometimes they are terrible, but sometimes they're fun. And you don't want to your kid to not believe anything you say because they told them, just don't do drugs. Drugs are bad. You'll die right? Because they're not always bad. Um, emphasize how drug use can affect the things that are important to your teen. Are they in theater? Are they driving? Are they playing soccer? Um, how can those things be affected by drug use? Do you have any friends that are using drugs that, you know, you've noticed a change in them? You know? um, consider social media. I just read something that said like 57% of Teenagers are depressed because of social media. There's a big influence. Um, only shows the good part of things. Go through, go on YouTube and Google kids freaking out, um, smoking special K, right? Look at videos of what happens to people when they use drugs. Videos are, use the social media to your advantage. 
um, discuss ways to resist peer pressure, how to turn stuff down. Maybe your child is kind of shy or not real assertive, and if somebody offers them something, they're likely to say yes just because they want to be cool. That's the main reason I started doing drugs. I wanted to be cool because I was a nerd, and I just looked so cool holding a cigarette, right? Um, so they, maybe they want to fit in. So discuss with them ways to say no. Um, and then be ready to discuss, discuss your own drug use and mistakes. If you are in recovery, if you're a person that used to use drugs or alcohol, maybe your parent is, or you have an aunt or an uncle, sibling, something like that, that can talk to them about their own experiences um, and what that experience taught them. That's really helpful for kids too. Okay, personal recommendations. I know this is a lot, but this is like the kids being safe part. So um, have a ha healthy, active family that values health in general. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. You guys are church people, so you can emphasize that part of it. Like God doesn't want you to pollute your body with drugs and alcohol. Um, have a safety plan. I cannot emphasize this enough. Have a safety plan. Be open to communicate and don't freak out when they tell you something. Um, explain about, go back and look at the slide, the slide about how um, their brains are not fully developed, about how neurotransmitters work, what drugs do to your brain. Kids are smart. They go to school. It's like basic scientific stuff. They'll get it. Um, emphasize that pills and powder are very dangerous right now due to fentanyl. Ask your child's school if they have Narcan. Talk to the nurse. Talk to the principal. Do you guys have Narcan in school? Do you know how to use Narcan? Um, tell them to never mix drugs and alcohol. Your kid's about to go off to college. Like, hey, you know not to mix, right? Like, don't mix alcohol with anything, not even a Tylenol. Do not mix. That's how people die. Um, there's something called the potentiation effect where if you take a pill and you take alcohol and it increases the effects of both of them, so they're more likely to pass out or act, be super drunk on two drinks because they mixed it with something. Um, have them learn about safe drinking limits and what a serving is. Go back and watch the slides until you do a little math with your kid. Okay, this bottle has... 12 ounces. So how many shots are in it? How many servings is that? Um, and then since you guys, the spiritual aspect of it is make your prayers. Sorry. My daughter, she probably knows what I'm talking about. Her. Um, make part of your prayers for your kids close calls where no one gets seriously injured or hurt. So when I, when my kids started driving, my prayer would be, okay, Lord, please give them close calls or no one gets injured or hurt. So one of my kids would come home and he'd go, mom, I was coming down Calaveras and this guy just came out of nowhere and I had to swerve. And I'm like, thank you, God. You know, he had a close call that he learned from. He's learned how to become a more defensive driver and nobody got hurt and nobody got injured. That's the kind of things that you want to pray for, right? Because they don't learn from your mistakes. Wouldn't it be great if we could just tell our kids, I did this thing one time and then this thing happened and you shouldn't do it, they're going to go, okay, it's not going to happen to me. They learn from their own mistakes. But just keep that in your prayers. Close calls, no one gets hurt. Close calls, no one gets hurt. Um, and then uh, remember that if your child experiments with drugs and alcohol, that is not a reflection of your parenting. Does not mean that you're a bad parent, all right? All sorts of good parents have kids that use drugs and alcohol. It's just part of the growing up process sometimes. So don't feel like you can't talk to anybody about it or people are going to judge you and don't judge yourself and don't think your kid's a bad person. It's not a reflection of your parenting. Um, okay, that is it. Yay! And we still have two minutes left if anybody has any questions or wants to discuss anything. Did anything come up during the presentation? I hope you have questions because we went over a lot of material and I know you couldn't possibly absorb it all. So, um, on that note, write your email down. I have all the slides. Um, use it as a reference. Uh, I went to a class in the 7 8 years ago and looked at it. Mm. I looked at it. I used it to keep this sort of in order. So, uh, like I said, I'm not the perfect parent. These are, it's really hard to like have open, honest communication with your child. The one about drugs and alcohol? 
I would say, hey, tonight I went to this workshop. I don't know if you know this lady, Martha. She's around her, she's real tall. She's been like shepherd and stuff. Uh, she's this great presentation about drugs and alcohol, and I learned a lot of stuff. Like, I would love to talk to you about drugs and alcohol because I know it's out there, right? I know you're going to get exposed to it. Um, not like, I know you're going to do drugs, but drugs and alcohol are out there. I would like to know how you would handle it. Like, what are your friends doing? Um, have you ever heard of fentanyl? Have you ever, you know, like what drugs have you been exposed to so far? And I want you to know, I'm not going to, I always want you to know that you can talk to me and I won't freak out or find somebody else. You know, have them talk to Troy, have them talk to DJ, um, have them talk to me. That's fine too. Uh, and know the resources that you need to have. If your kid comes to you and develops a problem at some point, know where to go to get them into treatment, right? Like if you have Kaiser, they have a program. If you have um, youth system of care, you can call it. The county has programs for teenagers. Um, just... The, like, don't send your kid to rehab if you find out they're smoking pot. That doesn't mean they need to go to residential treatment, right? But you can open a discussion about it. You know, maybe you're at the skate park with your kid, and there's some kids there smoking weed, and you're like, hmm, I smell marijuana. I know this and that about marijuana. What do you know about it? You know, it's, it's a good time to have conversations is when you're driving in the car, Right? Or when you're doing something, you're sitting down and staring at your child and wanting to talk to them usually doesn't work because they're like, eh, Mom. Eh. But if you're driving and they're sort of held captive because you're all in the car together, maybe their friends are in the car. I had a lot of conversation with my son and his friends in the car about different things. And they also talk like you're not there. Right, They're back there talking and gossiping. It's like you're invisible. That's a, it's a good time to have a conversation. Um, kids like to talk while they're doing something else playing basketball, whatever. Especially boys. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, hopefully that will help. But yeah, uh, DJ's got the slideshow. Yeah, and I know it's eight, so feel free. I know kids got to get picked up. Um, but I know Martha said she's happy to stick around. Yes. Yep, I will stick around. If anybody has any questions, they don't want to ask it in front of people or anything like that. I'm more than willing to talk to your kids or yourself whenever. Send them my way. I'll talk to them. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you.